hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. reading this morning will come from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with me, we'll be starting in chapter 12, uh, verses 22, starting 22. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. 
Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If you're not able to do such a small thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Our next reading will come from Ecclesiastes. We'll be in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 24. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Mason. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So there's this uh, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago from a uh, teacher of psychology, professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, and um, his name is um, excuse me his name is Robert Siegelman. And one of the things that uh, excuse me Martin Siegelman Martin Siegelman one of the things that he talks about in the book is he goes back and he talks about two major research projects that were done. Uh, in the last century that talked about happiness and whether or not the state of our personal happiness has the ability to uh, extend the length of our lives. Pretty uh, gutsy project, really, because it would be hard to demonstrate, hard to prove. There are so many different variables in all of our lives that would make it hard to have a, a field of research to be able to say there is enough similarity in these individuals to be able to conduct this project and demonstrate with any kind of uh, plausibility that uh, one's happiness could determine whether or not they were likely to live longer. So what they did was, I think, rather brilliant. In 1932, they got a group of people and they tried to find a group that would be as similar as possible. And so, and this is the brilliant part, they interviewed a group of nuns. Think about it, same gender, same religion, same access to health care, same standard of living, same income, same marital status. They used all of these nuns. And when they took their final vows for their orders to enter into the convent, they were each asked to write an essay. And it was just an essay that they would keep and it would be published in their journal. And so each of these nuns wrote a simple essay. And then this team of researchers, years later, <clears throat> went back and they looked at all of those essays and they looked for key words within them. They looked to see if the nuns ever mentioned anything about their happiness or used words like joy or fulfillment or excitement or expectation um, of, of, of hope and that kind of thing. And then they looked for the essays that didn't include those words about joy, happiness, things along those lines. And then what they did is they waited until each of those nuns turned 85 years old. And then they went back. And they found that the nuns, that when they first took their orders entering into the convent, the ones who wrote about things like joy and happiness in their essays, they found that 90% of them were still alive at age 85. The ones who didn't write about it, 33 percent made it to 85. Pretty striking when you think about it. Another essay that he wrote about, or excuse me, another study that he wrote about was uh, a group of students at the University of California. And they went and looked at another college's graduating class of students, and they looked at the women. And when I say that they looked at them, they looked at their yearbook photos for their senior class photo. 
Now, in psychology, and this is, was all news to me as I was reading about this in these books, in the field of psychology, there are thought to be two different types of smiles. The first smile is called the Duchenne smile, and the Duchenne smile is one uh, that is a natural smile for us. It's the one where the corners of our mouth perk up a little bit. It's the one where the corners of our eyes crinkle, and we get those crow's feet. It's a, it's a natural kind of smile. It's a joyful, happy smile. Okay? And then there's the second kind of smile, which is called the Pan American smile. And I love this. The Pan American smile is not named for any geographic reasons. It's named for this, the flight attendants that appeared in Pan Am advertisements at the time that this, that this term was coined. And it's a very insincere smile. Now, everybody can look at uh, photos from a yearbook and determine which people have a genuine smile where they look like they're happy, and then there's the ones that sort of are the forced smiles. It's interesting, as you have children and you watch your children grow up, there's always that stage where they can get the giggles from what the photographer says, and then there's the time where the photographer just sort of gives up and he just says, smile and show teeth, and you get it always, there's always a couple years where you get that, you know, <laughs> kind of picture. And you know what I'm talking about. It's more of the show teeth, grit your teeth, show some apprehension on your face smile, right? And so that's more of the, the Pan Am, the Pan American smile. So anyway, this group of students at California, they looked at this other college, senior pictures of these women. And they, they just went through and they circled the ones in one color that were the Duchesne smiles, and then they circled in another color pen the ones that were the Pan Am smiles. And then they went back at various stages throughout those women's lives. They checked in every few years. And they gave them uh, those surveys around, around happiness and satisfaction and things of that nature. And they found, again, a ma major discrepancy between those who, who offered a, a sincere Duchesne smile in their pictures and the ones that had a forced smile. They even said, well, maybe it's because those women, uh, maybe they were more attractive and they had a, a, a better chance at succeeding. No, didn't have anything to do with that. Whether or not they found a person was happy could be detected much more in their smile than their attractiveness or even what uh, their life was like going up into college in their previous experience. Fascinating information. Fascinating information that would seem to suggest that happiness isn't something that we just say is this, you know, abstract construct that we want to go chasing after, but instead something that is, is valuable to us. It, it shapes our lives and perhaps, even at least according to these studies, gives us a chance at longevity in life as well. Now we've been talking about happiness and how that impacts us and what we might do to try to bring that about from a, a faith-based perspective. How we as Christian people are those who are always searching for happiness and, and want to find our happiness rooted in our faith, in our belief in God. So for the past month we've been talking about this. First Sunday in January we spent some time talking about how statistically in global measurable data it would seem to suggest that things, for the most part, seem to be getting better. At least as far as on a global scale, things seem to be getting better when it seems like much of what we read and hear about would seem to suggest the contrary. The second week we talked about the difficulty we have in being second place or being number two. And yet when we looked at the life of John the Baptist, we see that he found his greatest satisfaction in life when every time he had the opportunity, he would step back out of the spotlight so that Christ could step forward. And he took that position as a follower of Jesus or one who sought to give the attention and the glory to Jesus and that brought him happiness in his life. Last week we looked at a, a equation coming at it from an engineer's perspective. And we talked about how our perception of events minus our expectations made a difference on whether or not we found happiness. And some of you found that meaningful too. So today we're going to go and we're going to talk a little bit more about what it is that we can actually do about it to find happiness in our life. Now, also in Seligman's research, he talked about something that he said is a common struggle. And one of the common struggles that we have sort of seems to be naturally a part of who we are as human beings 
is we spend our time in pursuit of things that we think will make us happy, which tend to not be the things that make us happy at all. And it doesn't seem to matter how much we know this, practicing that lifestyle is an entirely different thing. Right? We all know that there are certain things that are better for us, but we do the opposite thing anyway. So knowing and doing are two different things, of course. And he would say, the things that we oftentimes times find ourselves pursuing are the things that he calls our pursuit on the hedonic treadmill. And by that, he means we keep running on the treadmill, reaching out and striving to get those things that when we get them, quickly pass us by and then just repackage themselves the next go around. So we've talked about that a little bit already this month, but think about what some of those things might be. Every one of you has saved up money or splurged on something that seemed very special for a moment, and then it lost its shine and we moved past it. Right, the newest gadget, the newest technology, 10 inches larger television, you know, that kind of thing. And we keep doing that. It's like we're on a treadmill, he says, where we keep striving for something, we get it, and then it's gone. Right, that's a part of who we are. We do that with things that we want to buy. We even do that with people. We want to be closer to someone because we like the way that we might feel in their presence. Or we want to date somebody because they're interesting or attractive to us, but we learn quickly that after a short period of time, eh, they're really not a great match for me, but it was what I thought I wanted in the moment. So this is, this is a story that's told over and over again, and doggone it, we keep doing it, right? I mean, it's just a part of who we are. So he calls that the hedonic treadmill. Interestingly enough, when it comes to things like money, money, he says, does matter, but only to a point. So he says that money only matters to the point where you want to be, you, we are more happy when we are not in dire poverty, right? So he says that if you have enough to feed yourself, enough to clothe yourself, enough to have shelter, that's what we need for money to help make us happy. But he says, but anything on top of that, there really isn't much gain as far as happiness is concerned. So you may like the idea that may make you feel good that you make $5,000 more than last year or $30,000 more than you did uh, a decade or two ago. But the truth of the matter is, is that he says there's not much difference between say making $40,000 a year and $200,000 a year after the initial impact has worn off. Because the things that you need to survive are cared for at both levels, but there's not much more happiness over time in a greater wealth. He points out that even as you consider the lives of billionaires, he says what happens as you tend to look at the lives of billionaires, you'll find that the company that they end up keeping is with that of other billionaires who are living that same lifestyle. And then, their yacht, which is 10 feet longer than yours, starts to look a little better. Their mansion in Italy is a little nicer than yours in Greece. And so, again, the treadmill continues. He says that never goes away if that's where we look for happiness. There's also uh, a lot of research done by another uh, professor of psychology at Harvard named Daniel Gilbert. And Gilbert spends his time uh, in, his, in his latest book, talking, it's called Stumbling on Happiness. He talks about one of the things that makes it so hard for us as human beings to find happiness is our ability, unlike any other creatures on the planet, to be planners, to think ahead, to be forward thinking. Now he says sometimes that's really good and there can be happiness in our ability to plan and think ahead. He said that he did a study a few years back and the study asked the, the field of participants and said to them, look, we are going to award you for participating in this study a fancy dinner at this particular restaurant. And he said, now here's the deal. We can go there right now and you can have that meal. You can have that meal tonight for dinner or you can wait one week from today and have that dinner. And he said almost all of the participants when given that choice said, I want to wait until next week to have that dinner. Why? Because we like to have something out on the horizon to look forward to. 
We like thinking about it. We want to peruse the menu. We want to, we want to think about what that will taste like. We want to think about what we'll wear. We want to think about the time of the night that we'll make the reservation, who we'll go with, and all that stuff. That matters. And so some of the future planning we do actually brings us joy. Some of you have experienced that when you think about your plans for next Saturday. Or what are you going to do for a trip this summer? Those kinds of things. They cause us to get excited. They cause us to look forward to something. And putting it out there as delayed gratification is actually a valuable thing that brings us some level of happiness. But he said, far more often is the case that we think about the uncertainty of the future and we start to get concerned. We start to worry. Or we plan for a future that as it gets closer, we realize that's not actually going to happen. And so we go back to last week's formula, right? The expectations about something don't measure up to reality by the time they get closer to us. And so we uniquely have a challenge as human beings in the fact that we can plan and forecast for the future, but oftentimes it causes us a great deal of unhappiness. So funny, all of these researchers, all of these scientists, all of these psychologists that I've been reading actually seem to agree on the same thing that someone said 2,000 years earlier. Who is the one who said, as you heard from Luke's Gospel, can you, by worrying about the future, add a single minute to your life? Don't be concerned about fashion. Don't be concerned about the greatest restaurants. Don't be concerned about any of that. Be concerned about now. Consider the lilies. Look at the world around you. Look at what God has given you. Look at the blessings that you have. Don't worry about out there. That's going to happen. God's got it. Consider being a part of the world around you now. We go back even further to the Old Testament and we find the ancient words of the sage from that quirky book of Ecclesiastes who in that book, the sage, is writing to younger students, and he's talking about wisdom, because this is one of the books that fits within the section called the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And the wise things that he wants to pass on is he says, look, I've been rich, I've been poor, I've had friends that have come and gone, but let me tell you what's most important. Let me tell you where you can find the greatest satisfaction and happiness in your life. Enjoy the meal you eat tonight. Look at those that you love who are around you. Know that God is with you. And that is where you will find your happiness. It's funny when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, aren't the times that you have found the greatest peace and contentment, times when it's not the most elaborate things that you've ever done, the most money you've ever spent on something? I remember as a teenager, at a, at a dinner with the family on Christmas. And I still feel this, this way every year, especially on Christmas. But we have put so much celebration, tradition, pomp and circumstance into what goes into that very loaded holiday with expectations. And I remember as a kid, the first time that I said, you know what, the best part of this day is sitting down to this dinner together. All of a sudden, the presence that I used to look forward to as a child didn't matter as much. And now when I push back from the table and look at my family, the company that I'm keeping, the stories that we're telling, the memories that we're making, the stories that we're sharing, all of that, that's what does it. That's when that peace and that happiness washes over me. It's not when I say, hey, let's go spend money on something together. Shoot, you could burn the ham. It wouldn't matter. You're still gathered around that table, right? And that's what matters. That's the moments that counts. It's that, it's that being present. It's that recognizing just how blessed you are. Now, of course, this is not something that you can share for everybody. We talked about this last week. This has to be something that you are willing to adopt for yourself. Because it's not fair to say to someone who is suffering, hey, 
just suck it up and look at how good things are around you. Be more optimistic. That, that, that's not for you and I to say. But for most of us who are not at rock bottom in our lives right now, who are not suffering greatly at this current moment, who are worrying about the future and forecasting ahead and on that hedonic treadmill, instead, we need to be saying, perhaps maybe I need to be more present in the moment. Some of you know uh, the works and the writings of Barbara Brown Taylor. She is an Episcopal priest and a uh, college professor. And she wrote a book a couple years ago called An Altar in the World. And she talked about finding God everywhere around us. And I want you to consider these words which she talks about mindfulness, being present, and what she calls reverence. She says, sit down somewhere outside, preferably near a body of water, and pay attention for at least 20 minutes. It's not necessary to take on the whole world at first. Just take in the three square feet of earth on which you are sitting. Pay close attention to everything that lives within that small estate. You may even decide not to kill anything for 20 minutes, including that salt marsh mosquito that lands on your arm. Just blow her away and ask her to please find someone else to eat. With any luck, you will soon begin to see the soles and pebbles and ants, the small mounds of moss, the acorn that's on its way to becoming an oak tree. You may feel some tenderness for the struggling mayfly that the ants are carrying away. If you can see the water, you may take time to wonder where it came from and where it's going. You may even feel the beating of your own heart, that miracle of ingenuity that does its work with no thought or instruction from you. You did not make your heart any more than you made a tree. You are a guest here. You have been given a free pass to this modest domain and everything in it. We all struggle with this. We get on that hedonic treadmill and forget about the fact that we stand on this three square feet of land below us. What a miracle it is. That word hedonic comes from the Greek word hedonia, which is where we get the word hedonism from. Sometimes it's translated in scripture as happiness, but really it's probably more accurately translated as pleasure like hedonism and chasing after pleasures. That's what the treadmill's about. The pleasure treadmill, continuing to reach for it and then it's fleeting, it's gone. But the other place that we find scripture referring to happiness uses a word that is eudaimonia. And eudaimonia is a word that is a combination of two Greek words that means good and spirit. That's a different kind of happiness. That's a happiness that's not a treadmill happiness. That's a, a permanent kind of happiness that, that is fixed in the world around us. That's the kind of happiness that when we step back out of the limelight and allow Christ to step forward and be our leader, that's the kind of peace that we find. That's the kind of happiness that we should be pursuing, the kind of good spirit. And when we do that, we won't always just be praying for kingdom come, but we will be praying to see kingdom now. And we will recognize that the kingdom is giving us glimpses all the time of the world as God desires us to create it, of the world as we are supposed to see it and living as people of gratitude, present in the now, living <coughs> for the happiness of good spirit. And that, I pray, is where each of us will begin to find our home. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help us as we strive and reach and find ourselves on the treadmill. Help us to consider the lilies. As we worry about a future that is, for the most part, well beyond our control, help us remember that by worrying we don't add another moment to our lives. As we sit down to a meal, gathering with loved ones, looking at the sincere smiles on their faces, help us to pause, take a mental snapshot of that moment and to realize just how fortunate we are. God, for the things that are well beyond our control, we entrust them to you. 
and ask you to help us remove that burden from our shoulders. And for the ways that we have an ability to find happiness in the good spirit that you give us, help us to relish those moments and to do our part to make more of them. We do pray for thy kingdom come. We do pray to recognize thy kingdom now. We pray these things in earth as it In Christ's name, amen. Friends, let's sing together.